Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Steve Brierly from River Lane. Um, and uh, Steve will be talking about uh, recent developments in quantum uh, software. So please take it away, Steve. Great, thanks, Pete. Uh, yeah, this is gonna be an overview of uh, recent advances in quantum software. Um, yeah, I wanted to start actually with another conference. Uh, so in 2013, I, I was at a conference in Sicily and there was a straw poll of who thought or how long would it take uh, to build a quantum computer and or at least one at scale um, you know and most of the audience i think like me were more, more or less optimistic and and about perhaps 20 or 30 percent of people voted that there'd be a quantum computer in the next 10 years at least one with with a reasonable amount of, of scale um, uh, the other half of the audience, perhaps about 50% of the audience, thought it would take uh, 30 years before we saw a, a large-scale quantum computer. Um, but what really shocked me was that um, over half of the audience thought that, in fact, um, it would take at least 50 years to build a large-scale quantum computer, and, that, and in fact, some people felt there would never be a quantum computer. You know, and this was a, a theory conference uh, about quantum information working on uh, quantum algorithms um, and um, I guess uh, foundations of quantum mechanics you know and it was a bit of a oh shit moment really for, for, for me because it was really saying that at least a large proportion of the uh, community feels that building a quantum computer is going to be seriously hard and, and in fact may not even happen at all and so whilst this is super interesting it might not have any practical relevance um, so being a good uh, uh, scientist I thought well let's think about the let's, ha let's take away um, let's go find some data on this. So what, what, what are people actually doing in the lab? And can we compare and see trends over time? Um, so this is a plot that I produced a, a couple of years ago, um, uh, tracking the development of the two major types of, of quantum computing system, trapped ions and, and superconducting systems over time on a log scale. So quantum power here means approximately your uh, worst case fidelity. So typically uh, two qubit gate fidelities. Um, and in each, uh, each dot is, is one expensive experiment, one equally expensive experiment published in the top journal. Um, and so what I took away from this was, was not that, you know, one, one is winning or, 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 or that there's, uh, one is, is proceeding faster than the other, but the general trend, uh, there's, there's some kind of Moore's law happening in quantum computing. And if you think about where that, what that leads to, it gets super exciting. And, and of course we saw um, announcements last year um, from Google, from John Martinez about quantum computational supremacy. Um, so yeah, at the time that really made me think, now, now I should think about uh, uh, what are we gonna do with these large scale quantum computers? How are we actually gonna turn them into something useful? Um, and that's where the, for me, the, the, really, the story of quantum software starts. Um, so I think the first thing you have to take on board when thinking about programming a quantum computer is that they have this massive input output problem, right? You can input a small polynomial size problem into your quantum computer. Yeah, great. Then you get this exponentially large set space, but then at the output also has to be polynomial in size. Um, and that dramatically limits uh, the, the kinds of things you can do with quantum computers. So for example, you're not gonna use a quantum computer for a big data problem unless you can find some smart way of compressing your data um, so that you can input it in your, into your quantum computer. The second important part on, uh, of quantum software is that the size of the speed up really matters. And I, I would say it matters a lot. Um, so here we've plotted um, the, the kinds of speed ups you see across the different applications in, in uh, quantum computing. So there are you know, around 500 papers in the quantum algorithm zoo. And if you go through each of them, uh, you can more broadly categorize them into having an exponential speed up over classical computing, uh, polynomial type speed up. So here I've plotted a square root speed up or some speed up that we don't really know yet because it's a bit of a heuristic algorithm. Um, and, and I think the important point is that quantum computers are competing against uh, 50, 60 years of CMOS technology. And so we really must have a very large speed up in order to compete, in order to cross over with the next best classical alternative. And for me, the next best alternative is something 
comparable in, in cost. Um, so a quantum computer is going to be uh, a very expensive machine. So you, you could also buy you know, a million dollar HPC uh, in compute power. So that's uh, 10 to the 15 operations a second, um, or about um, 10 to the 20 operations by the end of, of a single day. Right? So, so if you have a square root speed up and you're competing at something that can do 10 to the 20 operations, well, you need to be able to do at least 10 to the 10 operations in the same amount of time. Right? So that's why um, you know, having an exponential speed up makes such a big difference for quantum computers. And of course, the famous one is uh, Shor's algorithm. Um, but I'm going to talk more about uh, quantum computational chemistry. Um, perhaps just one final point on this slide. The um, heuristics, of course, are, are important. And in fact, many classical algorithms um, are used outside of where we understand their performance. So we shouldn't be afraid of heuristic, um, uh, heuristics in, in algorithms. It's just that it's very hard to say in advance how much better it's going to be. And so there are a couple of examples there in, in sort of optimize, optimization or um, uh, sort of generally quantum machine learning. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, uh, simulation on quantum computers. And I think this is a nice uh, analogy. Uh, so this is, these are images taken by a spacecraft that Juno launched in 2011. Um, and I think the amazing thing about this is that it traveled for five years, uh, 2.8 billion miles before it took these images, at which point it was going at 130,000 miles per hour. But the most amazing thing about this is that it arrived within a meter of the prediction. And that's because you know, this interplanetary trick shot that, that NASA was able to perform is based on an extremely good model that we have of motion at this scale. Newton's uh, mechanic, Newton's laws of, of physics tell us um, how the spacecraft will travel as it slingshots around uh, objects in space. Um, and, and so, you know, this ability to accurately predict uh, the motion of, of, uh, of, or accurately predict the physics um, uh, is ex extremely valuable and extremely useful in, in many different areas. Um, and the second thing that NASA had was, of course, the ability to solve these models. Um, so the computational power required in order to actually run these calculations is very large, but it's something that we are able to do because of the classical nature of the problem. And this contrasts, I think, very strongly with machine learning techniques, with models in machine learning. Um, of course, NASA didn't launch a thousand spacecraft and see which ones survived. Right? Um, so in machine learning, what you have is um, a, a particular data set that's generated in some way, and you can create a good model around that data set. But what it doesn't tell you is about points on, in the rest of the space, points over here, right? It just generalizes around the data. So in particular, um, we don't use the same model for uh, speech recognition as handwriting recognition, whereas really they're kind of pretty similar, right? Um, uh, so machine learning doesn't generalize to the whole space, unlike uh, uh, a model of physics such as Newton's model, you know, which is so good we call it a law. And of course we have other laws of physics and quantum mechanics is, is um, the hugely successful law of physics. And what we want to do is to solve these equations. Um, so I'm just going to quote Dirac here because I think he puts it so amazingly well. Um, you know, we, we have this underlying physical laws enough to explain the whole of chemistry. And the only problem is to apply these laws um, to make them solvable. And of course, the reason quantum mechanics is so hard, um, well, one of the reasons is that um, the number of coefficients grows so rapidly as the size of the system scales. So you know, to, in, uh, in, in chemistry, you have particularly, typically 10 to 100 basis sets um, for, for each electron. So you, know, you end up with sort of 10 to, or 100 to the n coefficients for n uh, electrons. And so you know, building bigger and bigger classical computers is never going to help you because uh, you only get an extra electron every 10 years or so. Now, because the next thing he quickly went on to say was, well, what we need then are approximate methods of applying quantum mechanics. 
Um, we need approximations to these um, laws in order to make them solvable. And that's what um, uh, computational physics and, and chemists have been doing so successfully for the past sort of 20 or 30 years. And I think you can kind of summarize the different methods um, as following. You, know, you effectively start with um, um, uh, quantum mechanics and you start giving up some of the physics. So you make the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, so you forget um, uh, uh, um, relativistic effects or you uh, give up on quantum mechanics entirely and, and just model the system by balls and springs. Um, truncate, truncating the wave function gives you a whole bunch of methods like Hartree-Fock or MP2 and so on. Um, and, and density functional theory is very successful in, in reformulating the problem. Um, but then you have the problem of finding the right uh, density uh, uh, functionals. Um, and so what does quantum mechanics do, or what does quantum computing offer? Um, it's the ability to take all of these different methods, which um, I think you can broadly uh, summarize as saying they trade speed, they, they trade computational uh, time for predictive power. So you can take something like linear scaling DFT up in the top left here. Um, this is very fast, um, but it predicts, uh, it, it makes in inaccurate predictions uh, for some systems. It, it works well in other cases, of course. Um, and so you can kind of think of all of the different methods that um, we have currently as trading speed for predictive power. And, and what quantum computing gives you is, is the higher level of accuracy, um, but with a, a, a polynomial scaling. Um, and so I think there are a huge number of, I mean, this has a, a massive impact, of course, and, and has been discussed very widely now. Um, I think some of the most interesting things are, I think, like on making, on breaking, uh, some of them is, um, in, um, uh, I mean, uh, the, for example, in the um, Harbour-Bosch process, or, uh, well, as an alternative to the Harbour-Bosch process, um, or in, in the discovery of um, new antibodies. Um, so yeah, the, there are uh, this, this one observation, I think this kind of, I, I think there are two things we can do here, right? So we can say, well, let's take our current um, method and, and make it a bit better, make it a bit faster, make it a bit more uh, predictive. And that will be great because you know, we'll speed up something that we're already doing. Um, but I think the really exciting opportunity is to say, well, well, what does this gap actually mean? What, like, if we can accurately model these new systems, then um, how, what, what, what can we do as a result? Right? Not, not just a, a small iterative improvement, but actually something completely different. Um, and I think that's where some of these applications get, uh, really come from. Um, so, so at the beginning, we talked about the development of quantum hardware. And I think there's the second exciting story is the development of software that's gone alongside that. Um, so on the left-hand side, the first plot is the, um, this kind of Moore's law of scaling in, in quantum computing. On, but on the right-hand side, I've plotted um, roughly how, what, what size quantum computer is needed. Um, so um, how many operations do we need to implement the full algorithm? Uh, and um, so in, for, for, for a fixed problem. Um, so I've taken here um, this met metallo enzyme uh, simulation problem that um, uh, Microsoft talked about in 2015 um, and, and scared it back and, and asked, well, if you use all of these different methods that have been developed, like how big does the quantum computer have to get? Right? How many operations do we have to perform on a quantum computer um, to get to the end of this calculation? Right, so we fix a calculation and ask over time, um, how hard is that calculation? And, and what you're seeing here is a dramatic reduction in the scale of the quantum computer you need in order to solve this problem as a direct result of improvements in, in quantum algorithms, um, in quantum software, um, and in error correction or, uh, techniques. So the first algorithm here is, is kind of, you know, um, Seth Lloyd's paper uh, that says, well, okay, this is something like n to the 11, so great, that's polynomial, it, that's super interesting, um, but the, the size of the calculation, if you actually work this out, is so large, it would never be practical. You would never actually be able to run it. Um, and so this um, of methods that have improved 
um, or reduce the size of the first, well, one of the first useful calculations that we know how to do today. So, you know, from 2013, we're now at a place where there are actually many ways to build um, hardware for quantum computers. There are many different physical systems being proposed to, to, to implement um, uh, quantum gates, uh, to act as qubits and so on. Um, and, and the developments in the algorithm side in the software have meant that um, uh, the, the, the scale that they have to get to has been decreasing over time. So how do we program uh, these, these, these uh, devices? Uh, I mean, Nilsson and Chuang is, is, of course, the, the Bible for, for the field. Um, I still have a copy here on my, my desk. Um, so, and in, in it's very prescient book. Um, in, in, in 2000, it said, look, think of a quantum computer as, uh, as a circuit. It implements gates and there are, um, there are uh, registers that are initialized. Um, and this is a hugely uh, important way of thinking about quantum computing, a very uh, useful way to think about quantum computers. And all of the results on quantum algorithms have largely been in this model of, um, of the quantum circuit. Um, so trying to reduce the number of gates, some gates have, are more expensive because of error correction and so on. Um, uh, but fundamentally, it's in this circuit model. I think what happens when you go into a lab, so this is uh, Winnie in uh, Sussex, is that you don't really find this quantum circuit model. You know, quantum computers just don't really look like this in, in reality. There's, um, there's some amazing physics happening, but an awful lot of control system hardware. And this is just for very small quantum computers, actually. Um, so, so this model of well, you know, perhaps there's a, a CPU controlling a quantum computer that's basically implementing quantum circuits and sending me back the results. You know, that's kind of useful, but um, it's not really where we're at today. And I think this problem becomes even bigger as uh, the size of the quantum computer scales up. So as we get to millions of qubits, um, we're, we're going to have increasingly complex control system. I think this way of thinking about a quantum computer is, as a finished product um, it's just, uh, um, it's just not, not true today. Um, what we really have is, is a very complex control system controlling this physics, trying to keep these qubits alive. Um, so if you just scale up, this control system gets increasingly complex. And so we need some way of managing that. Um, we need to actually open up the control stack so that uh, programmers can uh, send programs to the elements in the control stack. So that you know, typically involves uh, FPGAs. Um, there are analog devices, um, uh, pulse generators, and um, measurement readout amplifiers, and so on. And um, that's what we really need to control. Um, and so I think the, um, the, the next uh, 10 years or the next seven years of uh, quantum computing is going to be about realizing what's really in the lab and uh, writing programs for the hardware that's actually in the lab as this scales up and exploiting the, the benefits, the um, uh, avoiding the, the hard bits in the, in the phys physical system um, and developing algorithms around them. Uh, so I think that for me, that's how we continue this trend uh, to reduce the cost of building a useful quantum computer. We target the specific um, advantages for specific systems, and we, we program those. We exploit, for example, when some systems have faster uh, readout, so we exploit faster readout. Some systems, it's hard to um, uh, measure individual qubits, so, so that changes what, what, what we use in our algorithm. So this, I think now, that now is the time for this uh, integrated um, or this uh, close collaboration between hardware and, and software. Okay, thank you very much. Clapping on behalf of uh, over 260 uh, people in this channel here. Um, so there's, we've got a few questions uh, on uh, Slido here. Uh, the first is from Josh, Josh Silverstone. Um, yeah, uh, uh, sticking you to it here, Steve. What, what, you, you mentioned a poll of people's optimism about large-scale QC. When do you think we'll be able to say we have achieved it? Ah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, I, so I think it's going to be a, 
a useful demonstration of, well, a, a demonstration of, of a useful quantum advantage. Um, so for me, I think that will be in comparing a quantum computer against a, a large HPC, so something like Summit, so just as Google did with um, uh, random quantum circuits, um, but in computational chemistry. So the Summit will be running um, uh, some, some incredibly difficult computational chemistry problem, something that can't be easily um, simplified to balls and springs, so that's fundamentally quantum mechanical, um, and that will be compared to a quantum computer. And, and, and I think at that point we can see, yeah, that really is the kind of um, alpha go moment of quantum computing. All right. Um, next question uh, from Chris Morrison. Uh, perhaps I missed this, but could you please clarify, clarify what the quantum power metric you're using on your plots was? Yeah, sorry, that was a, um, a bit of a simplification. So um, yeah, essentially it's uh, one over the two qubit error rate. So you know, if your error rate is uh, one in a hundred, you would expect to be able to do a hundred operations before you fail. Um, so the quantum power is a hundred at that point. Um, and two qubit error rate because that's typically the limiting factor. Right. Um, and another uh, question to put you on the spot from Will Dixon, which platform do you think will be the first to realize a useful quantum computer? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, the, the superconducting systems, um, at least that um, uh, John Martinez is developing or, or that approach, um, that obviously looks very promising, but the, the complexity of the system um, does look incredibly challenging. Um, and in particular, using microwaves to control these superconducting systems, and that's gonna get very hot. Now there are people working on developing um, uh, uh, to um, to the microwave control or uh, the power in the fridge to to mitigate that that heat. Um, so yeah, I think I yeah. So I think each of these systems has problems and it has advantages. And so I I think actually the winner will be the people who can um, exploit the um, the particular advantages of that system. Okay, um, and uh, uh, there's uh, two more questions here. I think they kind of go together. Um, uh, one's, the more general one is, you know, in your opinion, um, which is more difficult uh, in, in quantum computing, the hardware part or the software part? Um, that's from uh, Narendra Achara. And then Jonathan Matthews asks kind of, um, uh, I guess along the, well, in the interface, um, what technology platform requirements are known for the classical control stack? Do speed requirements match current classical hardware? So I, I don't know. There's two separate questions there, but maybe somewhat related. Um, yeah, so which is hardest? I think I'm not going to make a political answer on. I mean, I think they have to go together. I, like the hard thing about um, uh, quantum algorithm design is you're you're uh, designing a, a, a an algorithm in an abstract sense, right? You don't you don't have a quantum computer in order to try out um, some ideas. I mean, you can simulate small systems, and certainly that is useful. Um, but you have to be extremely careful that you don't um, develop something that's unscalable. And I, I think there are quite a few examples of that where you know people have said, oh look, I'm going to use this um, variational method, and that will be uh, really ha helpful. I'll, I'll try to solve this particular uh, machine learning problem, for example. Um, and, and, it, and look, it works with uh, 10, 20 qubits. Well, it's just a small system. So um, how do you know it's, it's going to uh, work as it scales up? So that's really the, the hard part of uh, quantum algorithms research. Um, but fundamentally, we need the hardware developers. Otherwise, we're, we're toast. Um, yeah, so the second question about the was the, the speed of um, kind of, I guess maybe it's a bit of a bottlenecking question. What technology platform requirements or restrictions are known for the classical control stack? For example, do speed requirements match current classical hardware? Yeah, so I think this is really crucial, um, particularly if you have like in a superconducting system, sort of tens of nanosecond gate times, um, you have to um, implement your classical logic. Um, for example, your error correcting syndrome um, or decoder has to be um, has to solve before um, the, the within the coherence time of the qubits. 
Um, and so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So this is going to involve um, FPGAs for sure, um, because they are fast. Um, I mean, there's a lot of smart people in, the, in this field. Um, uh, you know, for example, in, in finance, high frequency trading is kind of, uh, these kind of techniques are used a lot. Um, so people do understand a lot about um, high speed uh, classical uh, logic. Um, but then you need a framework in, in order for that to operate. And this kind of black box model of a, a quantum circuit doesn't do that for you. Um, right. Okay, we better uh, move on to the next speaker there. Uh, thanks again, Steve.